So, uh, first of all, thank you for coming out. Um, this would have been a good day for you to choose to stay in your apartment, dorm room, home, office, or other warm and, and cozy environment. Um, I'm, I told Patrick earlier I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm particularly happy to get away from Palo Alto. The sunshine there is relentless, uh, and, and you just need a break every so often, and, and you guys have really provided that for me, and I thank you, I thank you for that. Um, so I have a number of different hats that I wear in the world in, in, in terms of my research, um, and um, I'm, I'm about to put on a new one, and that's what you're going to see today, and it's going to be work on an area that I have actually not spent a lot of time on, uh, but I'm turning my attention to, at least for the next uh, year and a half or so, uh, with my uh, longtime collaborator, Sean Bowler, um, who's the Dean of Social Sciences at the University of California, Riverside, uh, and an all-around good guy. Uh, as it goes without saying that uh, anything of merit that you find in the presentation today was my idea, and errors can be entirely attributed to Sean, um, and I'll provide his email address at the end so you can send nasty notes. Um, Oh wait, that, that slide I think is an error. <laughs> it was in this morning's presentation too. I don't know what's happening. My, my research assistant really needs to stop that. Um, what? It's a virus. <laughs> it's a virus on my machine. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, so I want to talk about um, a golem that has been plaguing political science for um, a little more than half a century. Uh, and that is the belief um, among political scientists that people should vote as we want them to um, in nice organized packages so that it's easier for us to study them. Um, there's good reason for that, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But in 1950, the American Political Science Association published a very famous report called Toward a More Responsible Party System. And the origin of that document was the, the observation that the party system that we have in the United States looks very different than the one that would be in a Westminster style government in Canada, Australia, uh, the UK. So for much of the Anglosphere, and for that matter, even much of the industrialized world. Um, and, and at that time, the Political Science Association bemoaned the absence of what they would have believed would be ideologically coherent parties with very clear programmatic platforms over which a voter could just simply choose. I'm going to choose a platform that's more redistributive or less redistributive, a platform that is more favorable to labor or more favorable to the investment class, a platform that accomplishes these economic ends versus these economic ends. That's what political scientists dreamed of in the United States. After four decades of sorting and shifting, American political parties are now more distinct than they have ever been in the history of the republic, at least with respect to economic issues. But we remain unhappy with what we got in the outcome. Nicole Ray, a political scientist, mused in the annual review of political science a couple of years back, be careful what you wish for uh, in this respect. Now, Though the parties themselves have sorted economically at the elite and elected official level, there is less that meets the eye, uh, less there than meets the eye, because of the the um, uh, what I call mass chaos, which is that the parties have not sorted particularly well at the grassroots, at the at the populist level. American party platforms might be economically distinct, but elections are not always contested entirely or even mostly on economic grounds. Uh, the electorates are simply less sorted than the candidates. And to make the point, 2012 really kind of illustrates this. In some ways, 2012, the presidential election we just lived through, was the most economic election in the last generation. We talked more about the economy than we did at any other time. Exogenous issues, extraneous issues played a much smaller role in the election. The Pledge of Allegiance, for example, was not an issue as it was in 1988, of all things. Um, and yet, at the same time, we still had huge numbers of working class people voting for the non-redistributive party and huge numbers of upper income people voting for the economic redistribution of the Democrats. So the leaders, the people who are running for office, continue to face incoherent party coalitions in the, in the populace. 
That is, to pull together a winning coalition in the United States, you do so um, not on the back of a party's clearly articulated economic preferences, but in spite of them. And so the link between leader and voter remains vexed. So the question that Sean and I are turning our attention to in this book project is why are party, and elect in the, party electorates in the United States so divorced from the issue of social class? Uh, the first part of that question is, is this really true? Are parties divorced from social class in the United States? The second is, is this consistent throughout subpopulations of citizens? That is, are all Americans equally divorced their class from their political preferences, or are there different ways that, that this happens? And third, is there a modal path to class and consistent political behavior, or are there multiple processes at work? And so that's what we're trying to, to dig our way into. Now we begin with a motivating observation. And the motivating observation um, are two fairly obvious and by now fairly well examined in political science uh, observations about the electorate. The first is a fair number of people with modest incomes consistently vote for the economically conservative party. And I'll give you some numbers around that in just a minute. Uh, the second, and one that's gotten a lot less attention, is that a fair, a fair number of people with higher incomes consistently vote for the economically redistributive party. Now, we in political science and we in the academy tend to focus on the first group of people. Why are all these poor people voting Republican? And that's part of the ideological bias of the academy, right? Poor people voting Republican strikes us as a complete mystery. Rich people voting Democrat, people with above median incomes, people who drive Volvos and eat arugula and listen to national public radio, that seems perfectly normal to us because that's us, okay? But that should be a mystery to us as well. And so we want to look at both sides of that uncertainty, both sides of that confusion. There is a grand normative assumption here. It's a normative assumption that's deeply built into the discipline of political science. It's more deeply built into the discipline of, of um, economics. But it is an assumption, and it is a normative one. And it, we should address it for what it is, and we're going to come back to it at the end. And that is that voting, or politics, should be about economic concerns. Pol political scientists, to some degree, and economists to an extreme degree, get very upset when voters are voting on some other basis. It just doesn't seem right to us. Why? Because government is in the business of providing public goods. And the debate over what government should do is usually over which public goods to provide and which level of public goods to provide. Those are economic questions. So to what extent should there be the collective provision of needs, goods and services for the population, um, and to what degree should that be large or small, and what services should take uh, precedence over others? Those are economic questions. So it stands to reason for us rational folks in the academy that if that's what government is about, surely that's what elections should be about. But of course, that's, that's not so. Um, kind of flowing from that, politics that takes place in other dimensions leads to wrong votes. There's a great article <clears throat> by Rick Lau and, and Dave Redloss called Voting Incorrectly. And, and they don't really mean it in those terms when they've taken a lot, of, a lot of crap over that. But they do, in fact, try to evaluate the degree to which individuals are casting ballots that are contrary to their interest or contrary to what they are articulating as their interest, whatever that might be. Now, clearly, this grand normative assumption is contestable. And in fact, you know, we have 200 years of American politics to suggest that American elections are contested on some other dimension. So we're going to come back to that. But, but, but anyway, that's the kind of background that we're, we're coming at this with. Now, there's been a lot of ink spilled on the subject of class-based voting, or the lack thereof, in the United States. Um, the most recent set of debates are familiar to many of you. So a guy named Thomas Frank wrote a, a fairly well-received book, got a lot of attention in the, in the punditry, called What's the Matter with Kansas? And in What's the Matter with Kansas, he examines a, a state with a history of progressive politics, a history of redistributive politics, and finds that over the course of the last 100 years, it's become more relentlessly conservative, such that Republicans hold every statewide office in Kansas. It's a very, very Republican state. Um, and he makes the claim that sociocultural issues, religious issues like abortion, gay rights, and those sorts of things, uh, displaced economic ones. 
and that that is the basis of working class conservatism. And that, in fact, a new conservative populism redefines the relationship between party and class. Arugula eating is wrong, because after all, what's arugula? And so normal people, decent people, people who go to church and work hard, watch NASCAR on the weekends and vote Republican. That's the argument for working class Republican populism. Now, Larry Bartels uh, wrote a series of responses which I'll group under the heading of What's the Matter with Thomas Frank, and makes a number of responses to this. The first response is that there's little evidence of change in the behavior of the working class. And I'll talk about, um, he's splitting hairs there, and, and, and we'll examine some of this. The second claim, he says, is that the working class is not economically conservative. And we'll examine that uh, today and in the book as well. The third is that religion is less powerful than Frank believes. This is an issue I'm going to, I'm going to take issue with Bartels' claim on this. And finally, what evidence there is is largely contained to the South. Another testable hypothesis, which we're going to take a peek at today. A third response to this class partisan mismatch comes from Mark Smith, a former colleague of mine at the University of Washington. Mark has a very clever book, um, which I think is wrong, but, but is very clever in his argument, where he suggests that the working class have been sold a number of GOP economic principles because the GOP has been better than the Democrats at selling their economic platform. So that the estate tax becomes the death tax. So that the wealthy become job creators. That was the word smithing of the last election. Okay. So the idea is that we recraft conservative economic policies in ways that the working class can be persuaded by. I'm going to show you in a minute why I think there's evidence to suggest he's wrong on that. Andy Gelman and his colleagues in Red State, Blue State set out to look at, the, uh, at an odd aggregate outcome, which is that um, uh, wealthier states are on average voting Democratic. This is kind of an aggregate examination of the, of the Volvo arugula eating um, Democrats. Uh, but he argues that it's driven by a number of geographic distributions, including religion. And he points out that within states, there's still a fairly positive slope on GOP voting and income, suggesting that there's still a, a fairly class-based relationship between the party's economic platform and who votes for it. There have been a number of other folks have addressed it, and even in some of my earlier scholarship, I looked at this. So we went to this question of, of Thomas Frank's claim of party populism. Is it the case that the image of the Republican Party has changed in the minds of the voters, and that it is the Republicans, not the Democrats, who are seen as the party of average folk? Well, the answer, frankly, is no. There's no evidence that Thomas Frank's claim that there's been a populist inversion of party image has taken place. And let me illustrate that to you. So these figures are taken from the soon-to-be-dead American National Election Study from 1970 through 2004, which is the years for which open-ended coding were available when we did this. <coughs> and what this does is it looks at the percentage of respondents who use a set of open-ended terms in their comments to describe each and the things they like and dislike about parties. So we're looking first, in, in, in figure 1A, we're looking at the use of the terms common man or poor. So what percentage of respondents identify the Democrats with terms like common man or poor, and what percentage of Republicans, ident or, or, what percentage of respondents identify Republicans with the term common man or poor? And as you can see, hovering at around 22% over time, um, about 22% of ANES respondents, going all the way back to the early 70s, associate the Democrats with the common man or the poor, and the Republican number has not changed significantly over that time span and roughly rounds to zero. So that's pretty stable. It's hard to look at that and say that there's been an inversion of who the populist party is. Now the opposite side are terms big business, upper class, or rich, and that appears in, in panel B. The red dots, again, represent the share of respondents to the National Election Study who use one of those terms in describing the GOP. And the purple, I mean the blue um, uh, diamonds are the share who identify the Democrats with those terms. And again, you have a stable uh, balance hovering at around 19% over the course of time, and a Democratic number that hovers right around zero. Uh, 
You cannot look at those two maps of party images. These are open-ended codes, whatever the respondent says, coded verbatim. You cannot look at that and tell me that over the last 30 years there's been inversion of party images. There just hasn't been. So that claim seems to be wrong. Now, Sean and I think that these literatures are talking past each other a little bit. And everyone seems anxious to be the last word on the subject. Um, the volume of class inconsistent behavior is still really large. Maybe it has an increase, which is Bartel's point. Perhaps the slope on income is non-zero for a Republican Party vote, as Bartels argues. But the, the amount of class inconsistent behavior is still, we think, very important. So here's Gelman's quote. Quote, in 2004, Bush received 62% support among voters making over 200,000 compared to only 36% from voters making less than 15,000. And we're supposed to draw from that a C, this is class-based voting. Yeah, but that means that 36% of Americans living at or below poverty are voting Republican. And 38% of the wealthy are voting Democrat, and that should still be a mystery that we want to examine. We need an explanation for this. So we think Andy and Larry and all these guys notwithstanding, we think there's still a puzzle that needs some address, to be addressed. So what might explain why someone with a higher than average income votes for an economically redistributed economic platform and why someone with a lower than um, average income votes for the party that does not believe in any form of public goods provision or economic redistribution. Well, here's some alternative explanations. And our plan in the book is to test all of them in various ways. And so I'll see what you think. So one potential argument is the false consciousness argument. That is, respondents don't know which policies are good for them. Political scientists love to say this sort of thing. Um, this is, this is the people are stupid hypothesis. So um, we, we make the argument that people with very low levels of political knowledge don't really know the impact of various economic policies on them. And so if that's so, if this claim is so, we should see lots of poor people affirming benefits of conservative economics. And we should see lots of rich people saying that redistributed economics works for them. So that's one hypothesis. People believe that at the personal level, economic policies that we as social scientists think we think are unlikely to benefit them, at least in the short run, uh, they, they're misguided. Second potential explanation is the mismatch of party to policy. That respondents see Democrats as elites and Republicans as populists. And as I've already mentioned, we've tested that elsewhere. There doesn't seem to be any evidence for that. Uh, and it's kind of beyond the scope of, of what I'm going to present today. But I'm happy to talk about it here, you know, if you want to explore it a bit. A third explanation is the social mobility experience, and a fourth explanation is social mobility aspiration. And you hear this a lot, both in the political dialogue, the discourse in society, and in academic circles. So the social mobility experience argument is the following. If you're rich, but you used to be poor, you might be more in favor of redistributive policies than other rich people are. The aspiration argument is, if you're poor, but you think one day you're going to be rich, you might be more in favor of wealth-enhancing policies than would seem to be reasonable given your um, low level of assets. So these are the experience and aspiration arguments, and we can test those. Last two explanations. One is the sociotropic consideration. Now, uh, I think my sense is that many of you in the room are not political scientists. Is that Ben, am I right? Most of these are not poli sci folk or? Yeah, OK. All right, so that's, that was my sense. OK, so sociotropism is an argument that political science has been making for about 30 years that says that people tend to evaluate government and policy. They tend to evaluate incumbent administrations not just on their own experience, but on the experiences of the society. You don't have to be unemployed to vote against the incumbent if unemployment is high. The fact that social unemployment is high is bad enough. We call that a sociotropic consideration. Well, it could be that respondents are prioritizing social well-being over their own and are genuinely concerned. And if that's the case, we should see meaningful disagreement 
between the policies respondents think benefit them personally and the policies respondents think are good for the country. But that requires us to have measures where we ask respondents what's good for you and what's good for the country. And I'm going to introduce that in just a minute because that's one of the innovations we have. And finally, there's the intrusion of other considerations. And I'm going to start talking about this right at the end. But this, I think, is going to be where the rubber meets the road. And we're going to talk about race, which is where I have spent much of my career. We're going to talk about religious conservatism, about which a great deal has already been written. But we're also going to talk about social gospel religiosity, or religious liberalism, religious progressivism, about which much less has been written. Though Eric McDaniel of the University of Texas has done some very nice work on the black church, kind of getting us a first step uh, into this process. So hold those thoughts. So we start by asking the question, how do we measure what people want from, from government in terms of economic policy preferences? Now, there's an old-fashioned way to do this. We ask people, are you conservative, liberal, or middle of the road? And then if they're conservative, we say, are you very conservative or somewhat conservative, and liberal, very liberal, or somewhat liberal? And we come up with a five to seven point scale. This is a seven point scale. Uh, where we try to look at the distribution of who's calling themselves conservative, who's calling themselves liberal. In this case, I've got liberalism on the x-axis, so higher values mean you're more liberal. And for those who have above median income, the concentration is just slightly more conservative than middle of the road. And for even those who have low, below median income, there's a big spike at the middle of the road category, and about as many people, or maybe even a few more people on the conservative side, as on the liberal side. You will hear this description of America on every Fox News broadcast you ever watch. America is a center-right country. The problem is that self-reported ideology is an extremely bad measure. And anyone working in political behavior um, knows this. Um, and it's a bad proxy for uh, policy preferences because it collapses multiple issue dimensions onto this one left-right dimension. So things like religiosity and race and other things that infect our politics get collapsed onto that dimension. It's not an economic measure. It's also the case that ideological labeling is really bad. People are bad at that. So uh, peop more people call themselves conservative than liberal, and that's true everywhere, even in liberal places, for reasons that just for some reason the word liberal got this negative taint in the 80s. Ronald Reagan was responsible, I think. Uh, or in the interest of recent events, Margaret Thatcher was responsible. And, uh, and so it got, a, it got a nasty sound to it. And so as a consequence, you'll get people in the United States, you get people on our surveys who will be for increased environmental spending, who will be for raising the minimum wage, who will be for higher uh, taxes on wealthy people, and then look you in the eye and say, I'm a pretty conservative person. No, you're not. But they don't necessarily know that, okay? So what we want to do is we want to measure economic ideology by asking people economic questions. So what we did was we asked a set of economic questions, and we asked each question twice. Would this be good, bad, or neither good nor bad for you personally? Would this be good, bad, or neither good nor bad for the country? And what we do is we do this across six different economic policy preferences. Now, this allows us to separate the sociotropic consideration from the self-interested consideration, right? Because we're not letting people confuse what's good for everybody else and what's good for you. We're specifically asking them to differentiate. And what we do is we add, we use the two distributions of policy preferences to identify people who get it wrong. And by get it wrong, this on a personal dimension means that they report believing um, in classic consistent policies benefiting them. And at the ideological level, they believe that class and consistent policies are good for America. Okay, so we have two different measures here. And this is to help us distinguish false consciousness, wrongly believing about personal matters, from sociotropism, which is believing uh, in an alternative uh, general economic policy for the country. Now, which six policies do we look at? We have six different measures. And the six different measures we look at are from the EGSS pilot study for this year's ANES was run approximately two th uh, spring of 2011. And the six economic policies are the following. End the current Medicare system and replace it with a system of credits. Raise the minimum wage every year to keep pace with inflation. Increase taxes on people making over $250,000 a year. 
increase taxes on corporations, replace Social Security with private retirement accounts, and reduce U.S. federal government spending on everything the government spends money on. So we have three policy proposals that are valenced progressively and three policy proposals that are valenced conservatively, okay, for scale balance. Now, I'll tell you the indices are a little noisy, but they correlate quite well with one another, but they correlate way less well with that foolish self-reported ideology measure. So if policies being good for you and policies being good for the country correlated 0.74, really strong correlation. People tend to think that what's good for them is good for the country, not entirely. But neither one of them correlates particularly well with the self-reported ideology issue. So what does the distribution look like? That's what the distribution looks like. That's a scattered density plot. We have personal things that affect you personally on this dimension, how things will affect the country on this dimension. Um, and what we do is we scale we end up looking at who um, in each group falls within the ideologically consistent behavior or hold a moderate position across the six issues. So we score moderation as right. We have a very forgiving algorithm for deciding who's being class consistent and who's being class inconsistent. We can make it tougher, but in the interest of, of, uh, of fairness, and I'll show that to you in just a second. So this is the distribution. And what you should already notice is Contrary to the self-reported ideology measure, among people, who, among all people, looking both at what's good for them personally and what's good for the country, the shift is in the liberal direction, not the conservative direction. When we ask those six economic policy questions, this is a moderate to liberal country, not a moderate to conservative country, as the folks on Fox would have you believe. What we've done here is we've walled out other dimensions. All that's here is a set of economic policy issues. And we get an ideological distribution that looks very different from self-reported ideology. If we look at, um, these are from below median income respondents. These are um, the poor folk. And we code people who get their totals out here as having got it wrong. So, if across the six items, uh, you have a score from negative three to negative six, meaning that you're getting it wrong most of the time, then that's considered ideological deviance at the sociotropic level and getting it wrong at the personal level, okay? So these are for below median income respondents. Looking at that scatter plot, if that is the distribution of folks who are below the median income, we code all those people as getting it right and only these people at the really conservative policies for the country, really conservative policies for yourself, those are the folks who are coded as getting it wrong. Now that was the below median income people. What about the upper income people? Maybe they're going to be way more conservative. No. Turns out even for people with above median incomes, their economic policy preferences are shifted in the liberal direction as well. Again, not consistent with this notion that this is a center-right country. Many more of them get it wrong. Either ex display ideological deviance with respect to what's good for the country, or simply get it wrong when deciding what's good for them personally. If we look at the scatter plot here, these folks get it right, and all of these very liberal um, personal beliefs, very liberal for the country, these folks are coded as getting it wrong. So this represents kind of shocking finding number one from the book. And that is 91% of people with income below the median income get it right, both for themselves and for the country. It is not the case that low-income people are dumb and don't know which policies benefit them. 91% of them choose moderate to liberal policies for the country and moderate to liberal policies for themselves. That is not evidence of dumb working class people voting against their own interests. Curiously, only 52% of upper-income people choose conservative policies for themselves and the country. 
So ideological <laughs> deviance at the policy level is very, very uncommon for low-income people and far more common for higher-income people. That was a shock to Sean and I. Our assumption, like most political scientists would be, was that it is um, going to be the working class who just doesn't get it, they don't understand the effect of economic policies on what's going to happen to their lives, etc., and they would get it wrong. When in fact, they get it right way more often than upper income folks do. Now, if I used a more demanding criteria of rightness, so instead of you know, people coding 0, minus 1, minus 2 as being right and made them wrong as well, we would still have over 74% of respondents in this cell for low-income people. And only 31% of respondents in this for high-income people. So the, where the criteria are, where we're, who we're categorizing as getting it wrong or getting it right is not really driving this result. Now one possibility is that not all these folks are equally politically interested, and maybe the politically interested will look different And it is true that if we limit this to people with high political interest, we see a little bit more ideological deviation, uh, at least with respect to uh, what's good for the country among the working class. We see even more ideological deviation in people with above median incomes. So this number goes down, kind of in the way we would expect it. But this number goes down in a way that we would not have expected. So does everybody understand what the differences are here? That when we look at just people who claim to be really interested in politics, it is still the case that 8 out of 10 low-income people prefer a liberal economic policy for themselves in the country. But only 4 out of 10 upper-income people prefer conservative economic policy. All right. So if we compare issue positions to, to the illogical self-descriptions, we see that we have a very different distribution. Um, and we also find that there's significant variation between pocketbook and sociotropic evaluations of policy, especially among higher income persons. So there's variation there. So what did we learn by that first set of distributions? Lower income respondents get it right. The false consciousness argument is wrong. It is not the case that working class people are dumb and they don't know what, what uh, cutting services or um, opposing minimum wage hikes and things like that do to them. Over a third of upper income folks deviate ideologically. That they favor really progressive economic policies and there's some evidence that some of that motivation is sociotropic. And controlling for higher levels of political interest increases the deviation of high income folks markedly. Now, I want to point out this notion that income quartile three and income quartile four look alike. One question I frequently get is not everyone who's upper income know that they're upper income. So maybe people who have just above the median income think that they're actually working class, they don't know any better. So they're misperceiving not the policies, they're misperceiving where they are in the economic system. And if that were the case, that the distribution of ideological preferences in the third income quartile should look really different than the distribution in the fourth income quartile. The really rich, and it turns out they don't. So those distributions, those two by two tables, they don't look that much different for the nearly, the higher income versus the extremely wealthy. They look about the same. Now what might be driving some of these distributions? So racial and ethnic minorities are one issue that comes up and Southerners are another. Now, why would racial and ethnic minorities be a problem? So on the one hand, low-income racial and ethnic minorities are far more likely to be Democrats. We know that racial and ethnic minorities tend to hold liberal economic policy preferences, so maybe they're inflating that 91% number. And if we look just at low-income whites, that's where the deviation is that people are talking about. That's one possibility. At the upper income level, we might expect that racial and ethnic minorities are uh, undermining ideological coherence. We have the work of Michael Dawson and others that suggest that linked fate makes uh, African Americans, even middle income or high income African Americans, vote with the interest of the group rather than their own personal interest. So what if medium and high income African Americans and Latinos are preferring 
uh, redistributed economic policy preferences on behalf of their family and, and friends and extended social networks. Well, that's not the explanation. If we take all the racial and ethnic minorities out and look just at white respondents, we still get 89% of below median income whites in this cell of liberal economic preferences for themselves and the country. And we only get 56% of upper income people in this cell. So taking racial and ethnic minorities out does not solve the mystery of why working class people are getting it right and high income people are getting it quote unquote wrong. So the second potential argument is the southern effect. Bartels himself argues that the effect is confined largely to the south. Well, that doesn't appear to be the case either. If we confine ourselves just to southern whites, for below median income folks, still 84% of southern whites hold liberal economic policy preferences for themselves and for the country. 92% of northern whites do. So there is a 9% difference between southerners and northerners in the direction you'd expect that southerners are more conservative. But it is not the case that's, that southern whites are wildly conservative in economic policy preferences. That's just not true. Now, keep in mind, I'm showing you that 84% of Southern whites are economic liberals, when somewhere between 80 and 90% of whites in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana voted against Barack Obama in the last two elections. So what's, what's floating out here is that eco economic ideological deviance does not necessarily match on to partisan deviance when we get to the election stage, and that's what we're going to go to next. Okay. So for, for below median income folks, there's about a nine point gap, but it is not the case that Southerners are exhibiting wildly different behavior than non-Southerners. If we look at upper income people, it's the same. Upper income Southerners are more consistently conservative than upper income Northerners, but it's still only 63%. It's not this wildly left. So the Gelman effect that he talks about shows that above median income Southerners are about nine points more likely to articulate class consistent economic policy preferences than similarly situated non-Southerners. And among whites, there's an observable Southern conservative shift or Northern progressive shift in economic policy preferences. But remember that these measures of ideology are devoid of anything other than economic considerations and therein lies the rub. So what's left to explain? We have clear evidence of ideological deviation, but it's only among higher income Americans. We have much less for lower income Americans, and this result holds, even accounting for race and limiting our analysis to the South. The problem is, we go back to Gelman's first observation. We still have over a third of poverty-stricken people voting against redistribution. So we still have the vote problem. So what we're going to do in the next stage is we're going to look at how ideological deviance matches to vote. And I'll show you those and then I'll wrap it up and, and hear what you have to say. So ideological deviance strongly predicts vote. But its effect is much smaller among working class people because there's so much fewer people to explain. So here are the below median income folks. For people who hold conservative economic policy preferences among below median income folks, they all vote Republican. But remember, this was 9%. 91% were in this column. And among the 91%, over 60% of them vote liberally. But here's the mystery. 40% of low-income people with economic policy preferences that are liberal for themselves and or the country are still voting for the GOP. So the deviation for low-income people is at the vote level, not at the economic preference level. If we get to upper income people, we see something different. Again, it is the case that those who hold ideologically inconsistent behavior, beliefs, are very likely to act on them in, in the election. Wealthy liberals, 90% of them vote Democratic. And remember, that's about 45% of the table. But among the 55% of the table, we get an almost a fairly even division of the vote. Even 46% of high-income folk who hold conservative economic policy preferences are voting for Democrats. 
So therein lies the mystery. These columns are interesting, but these columns are far more interesting in terms of unexplained change. To illustrate a little bit of that using sort of a different graphic, if we looked at all the low-income people saying that they were planning to vote for Governor Romney, over three-quarters of them still claim to be economic moderates or liberals. If we looked at all the upper-income people planning to vote for Obama, over 60% of them are, in fact, economic liberals. So ideological deviation is explaining less than a quarter of low-income partisan deviation, but it's explaining over 60% of high-income partisan deviation. All right. I'll illustrate it one more way and then I'll shut up. So if we looked at sort of above median income, these are people who hold liberal views, conservative views. If they hold conservative views, we have a, still a pretty even split. If they hold liberal views, they're going to defect in a large number. Um, that gives you the posterior probabilities. For people who are low income, if you hold conservative economic views, they all vote conservatively, but almost none of them do. The deviation takes place here uh, at the partisan choice level. So 78% of deviants diverge despite liberal policy preferences among low-income folks. So our conclusion is that there's different paths to ideological deviation. Uh, for higher income quartiles, economic ideology explains a fair amount of vote choice. But for low-income quartiles, class inconsistent voting behavior is largely not a function of economic beliefs. It takes place at another level. And in the next stage of the project, we test a variety of alternatives. So we look at social mobility, we look at racial resentment, we look at social gospel, and we look at religious conservatism to explain deviation both at the economic policy level and at the two-party vote level. And if time allows, I'll show you a little bit of that. Questions or comments or concerns? Yep. Uh, this is a, so I, I have a, maybe a long question. Um, sure. And it, I'm gonna, I wanna challenge you on the, on the very premise that you started out with and suggest that it's not such a mystery and that there's an alternative hypothesis okay. that doesn't appear. Um, so what this has to do with is the idea that, that much of what's going on has to do with people's assessments of performance and outcomes over decades, um, as much, if not more, than preferences. Um, so, what doesn't come? What I was surprised to see was there's no reference to, for example, Hacker and Pearson in here, um, winner take all politics, or to um, Teixeira and Rob Rogers' book on the white working class, the America's Forgotten Majority. From I know it's an old book from 2000. Um, but, I mean, even if you looked at the last three Democratic administrations, I mean, there's been a significant shift in the performance and outcomes that those administrations have exhibited in terms of economic policy. So, I mean, really the, the ba ba basic hallmarks of what we know as Reaganomics started under Carter with deregulation, the appointment of Volcker, and the embrace of monetarism. Um, cuts in social spending, increases in defense spending, et cetera, um, creating the so-called Reagan Democrat. Um, the Carter, I mean, excuse me, the Clinton administration with NAFTA, Telecommunications Act, um, embrace of balanced budgets, et cetera, and even Obama with, you know, a continuation of policies of that sort, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, proposed cuts in Social um, Security and Medicare. So what's interesting to me is that Hacker and Pearson show, and a lot of other people show this as well, that there's been an over, the political system as a whole has served the well-to-do, um, and that incomes have stagnated for over four decades, so that the outcomes themselves are ones that are not to, to living up to the people's preferences. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a hypothesis in Teixeira and Rogers that helps to explain Frank and give Frank some degree of support, which is that they show that with the white working class in particular, and it's been 13 years since I've read this book, so it's, I'm drawing on memory, that 
Um, if anything, over time, and this confirms one of your basic, basic points here, is that people have become more and more liberal. The white working class has become more and more liberal. How, and in particular, that they expect the government to solve, or they want the government to solve all sorts of problems around inequality. But what they've concluded is that it won't, or it can't. And therefore, they're no longer interested in throwing what amounts to good money after bad in the form of taxes on programs that have been demonstrated not to work and have been systematically dismantled over time. So that even if they prefer these things, they've lost faith in the ability for them to occur. And therefore, they're susceptible to arguments that say, we'll reduce taxes on everybody, even if we're doing it disproportionately for the rich, and to arguments about things that seem to have more traction, namely the kinds of things that Frank is emphasizing in What's the Matter with Kansas. Because mm -hmm. the way I read that book was not that it those things displaced economic issues, but the economic issues had already been displaced. And therefore, the only thing that seemed to loom large anymore were differences over social issues. So, and then the, the last thing is the voter turnout in the United States is, of course, lower than any industrialized country. And even if there's been a blip in an increase in recent years, it's still very, very low. And it's, the people who don't vote are disproportionately poor and working class. Um, so even if there's a difference between Republicans and Democrats, it's not a static difference. It's a difference of two parties that are moving to the right together over time. And even Obama said that you know, his policies, that if he were transported back in time to the 1980s, he'd be a moderate Republican. If he had been transported back to the 70s, he'd be a conservative Republican. So even if the Republicans are way more, the current ones, more conservative, these are parties that have shifted. So I think there's a, an alternative hypothesis there having to do with people's, the difference between what people want or prefer versus what they expect the political system to deliver. I am sympathetic to the question and to the claim. Obviously, Hacker and Pearson are in the, in the current versions of the paper, but not necessarily in the presentation. And, and the Teixeira, I, I don't know that book, actually. The, the it's Joel Rogers and Ruth Teixeira. It's called America's Forgotten Majority, the White Working Class. Yeah, I don't know that one. Um, OK, so Hacker and Pearson. Um, so let, let, me, let me respond in a couple of different ways. The first one I, I would respond is I think that your hypothesis works very well to explain upper class deviation, um, which is that the people who with, with high levels of information and with lots of income might conceivably find reasons to support the Democrats that are non-economic because you could argue they're going to get the same sort of economic return in either direction. In fact, Bartels in Unequal Democracy shows that the rate of income growth for wealthy people is actually higher among Democrats than it is among Republicans. The only difference is that the rate of growth for low-income people is higher among Democrats than it is Republicans, so that the relative level of inequality is smaller among Democrats than it is among Republicans. Now, that creates the perverse finding that people might prefer to be less wealthy if the gap between them and the poor is greater, um, which is really Machiavellian in terms of the assumption of what the wealthy might want, but we'll, we'll play with that in just a moment. So it might explain that. I'm less persuaded it explains uh, low income deviation for a couple different reasons. One is the level of penetration of issues like NAFTA and the Pan Pacific Partnership, et cetera, to low income folks is very low. The issue of party images, now I think I can, we, can, we can go into that if you like, but the level of awareness of what's actually in those uh, policies and the degree to which they're able to draw connections to their own economic circumstances is tiny. But then, um, if you look at economic performance for low-income people by party and the relative rate of income growth, it would be perfectly reasonable for low-income people to still conclude that they're better off among Democrats because, in fact, numerically they have been. That's, I mean, the rate of income growth is about as perceptible as the effect of NAFTA is on working-class folks. Now, we can argue about what people are aware of, um, but the suggestion that those low-income people believe that neither party will serve their purposes is a little bit belied by those party image graphs, which show that there's a relatively constant rate 
of association of Democrats with the interest of working class people. So while I take your hypothesis on its face as, as potential, we should see a decline in the association of Democrats with working class people, and we didn't. We did see a slight uptick of the association of Democrats with the wealthy, but it went from zero to one. It didn't go from zero to 20. Um, so there hasn't really been a change in party image among working class people in terms of what party they view as representing their interests, which would have been, which I would have expected to so, see if your hypothesis was So, right. I mean, again, I, I mean, I don't want to take up the time here in responding to all these things. It's a workshop. It, the, the point that people typically, um, the moment that people typically point to is the settlement, where things change significantly. So if we're looking this, at this over time, mm -hmm. the, the Democrats no longer have the same kind of support that they once did among the working class. That's correct. So, you know, I think, and I think that the traction that they have or the support that they have even since then has not been as robust as it once was, um, even when it was in higher numbers. So I think that it's a, it's, it, one needs to look at this historically and understand that there is a sort of a turning point. A lot of it having to do, of course, with the change in the global economy and the U.S. position in it. Right. So, so I don't necessarily disagree with your take on that in the following way. So what you're suggesting is that if the, that the enthusiasm with which working class voters attach allegiance to the Democratic Party on the theory that the party will return to them some return to income is lower. I don't necessarily disagree with that. But so then the question is, what does that mean that the economy declines as a predictor of two party vote? And if so, we should then see replacement predictors. And that's what we're talking about in the latter half of the book. So, if you're not going to vote on the basis of the economy under the theory that you're not going to get a significantly better return under one party than the other, then on what basis are you voting? What I'm suggesting is that this, this, the degree of deviance that, they're, that you're pointing to among both working class and upper class people um, isn't w perfect. And therefore, a lot of the explanation, can. there's a variety of different explanations to it, some of it having to do with just long-term loyalty to a party which may be growing thinner over time and that a lot of people continue to do that. But you also pointed out that a lot of people um, mislabel their own views. Um, and so I think that the preferences are such and are, are one thing, that they prefer liberal economic policies, but yet they vote conservative, they vote for the GOP in numbers that wouldn't, one wouldn't expect given those liberal preferences. That's right. So my, what I'm offering is this hypothesis that um, it's because they don't expect those preferences to be realized through the political system. Okay, I think that's a, that's a reasonable hypothesis. And, and it's a testable one. I don't have the data to test it now, but it, that's a perfectly reasonable question too. We do actually ask people, um, we do ask people general trust in economic questions, but we don't ask the specific how likely are you to get this policy. That's an interesting idea. Um, I'm going to make a note about that. Anybody else? Yep. So, uh, first, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the research again in that it's really looking at, you know, class, class conscious, consciousness, so to speak, in ways that it hasn't um, really been looked at much in the empirical literature and sort of class policy, class uh, standing mismatches. Uh, my, my one concern is uh, the ability to really say anything to the uh, false consciousness argument. So let's say I put it to you that the reason you got these results is you just happen to ask economic policy questions on which people in general happen to be really liberal on. Had you asked some, some other um, some other questions, you would have gotten conservative responses, and since um, class standing and class policy, excuse me, class standing and class policy preferences don't match up nearly one to one, you wind up, you would wind up with the other, uh, other finding that class, that false consciousness is far more prevalent among the wealthy and not among um, among the, the poor. So, you know, that, that's, that's the thing, right? False consciousness is very hard to test because it requires assumptions about where groups should be. Um, ideally, that the questions, you know, measure some sort of absolute 
position on a liberal to conservative continuum, which is always going to be subject to question selection, etc. So I'm not really sure that I fully buy um, assertions that this shows that false consciousness is not prevalent or is more prevalent among certain groups, but certainly for the effects on voting behavior, I mean, you're very, very convincing. Right. So I, I'm going to agree with you um, to, to a point and then sort of plead um, helplessness in the following way. So I'll agree to you, with you that in order to test false consciousness, we would have to look at essentially the entire array of economic policy preferences that, that exist in the public discourse and kind of chart out people's uh, opinions on each of them and look for distributions across each. That's absolutely true. It's also, of course, empirically intractable. So we, we asked six here. Um, we probably should have asked 12 or 18, but as you can see, you'll start to get diminishing returns on some that have, some that have much lower um, salience. So we could have asked about estate taxes, for example, or we could have asked, asked about um, capital gains tax. The problem is that we start to get into really uh, lower levels of awareness. So a significant portion of Americans can't define capital gains and understand that that's treated differently than other forms of income. So then we're actually having to define our terms in the, in the survey question, which becomes problematic. So yes, I'll plead sort of helplessness that I've got six questions here. In other uh, surveys, I've got a few others, which we're gonna be bringing into the book, but I'm never gonna have that exhaustive list of every potential economic policy question, in part because it's very difficult to ask lots of them because of the level of esoteric, um, the, the esoteric level of the nature of the, of the information. The other thing I'll say, though, is that one thing we haven't really played much with, I've got results I could show you, but you don't really want to see coefficients today, but um, is- I always want to see coefficients. <laughs> I'm not sure you represent the group, <laughs> uh, but, but I'll be happy to show them to you. I've got changes in predictive probabilities if you like. But um, that we look at, the, at the, the anticipation or experience of social mobility, because um, it's the anticipation of social mobility that is often the most common form of, of false consciousness. Many, many, many Americans who are working class believe that they will one day be wealthy, even though everyone in this room understands that they won't. Um, and so therein is another potential argument. And I've got some results on that, but I didn't go there today. It's, just, it's too much for a long time. Ben. Um, it was a great presentation, and it was, uh, and and you stopped just as it started getting really, really interesting for me. Um, I stopped just as it started getting really, really long. <laughs> but, <laughs> do, do you have any preliminary results on on, on your uh, your alternative explanations? I do. Uh, maybe you could briefly just run by this. Um, here are predicted effects of social mobility, race, and religion on ideological deviation. By and large, predicted effects on ideological deviation are not huge. Um, so uh, Southerners, uh, low-income Southerners, are slightly more likely to be ideologically deviant than, um, than others. Uh, religious conservatism has no effect on ideological deviation, you'll see in the next slide, it has huge effect on partisan deviation. Social gospel among high-income people makes them much more likely to be liberal. So high-income liberalism, above the bar, by the way, means that you're deviant. And the lighter bars are high-income, the darker bars are low-income. So the a social gospel makes you much more likely to be liberal. So we actually have a fairly strong explanation there. Racial resentment makes low-income people more conservative. That's not super surprising. The belief that you'll ever be rich drives down ideological deviation among the high income, who are already doing pretty well. Uh, but they're the folks who you know, believe they're going to be doing even better, and therefore they're not going to deviate from, from conservative economic policy positions. We get much less from the belief that you'll ever be poor. Um, the effects in terms of two-party vote, bigger. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, it, Obama's above the line Republican nominee, because this was before Romney had won the nomination, is below the line. Liberalism, both self-interested and for the country, certainly predicts a Democratic vote. But controlling for that religious conservatism does exactly what you'd expect it would. 
Social gospel does what it expects you would, what you would expect it does, but it has a much bigger effect on high income people than it does on low income people. Racial resentment does what you would expect it to do, but it has a much bigger effect on high income people than it does on low income people. That is not something we expect it to see. And the belief that you'll ever be rich makes poor people vote for Obama, which I totally didn't get. Uh, so that's, think of that as an anomalous result. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. So we do have some preliminary results. But I didn't want to go into all that because we were running out of time. Does that help? Oh, that's great. Send me your paper. We have to finish writing it. Anybody else? No one has any questions? OK. Uh, yep. I have a question. Uh, well, that question is just like an observation, though. Uh, I have a, a friend of mine doing his PhD on Tea Party movement. And um, he always keeps talking about how a lot of um, Tea Partiers are their social class um, location is people who are uh, oftentimes uh, higher medium or higher income, but also people who um, either uh, are independent business owners or somehow self-employed. And um, somehow they, the stories that they create about their own success is about they got it through no special favors and no special, like, through their own luck and pluck. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I've seen that just in the research I've done just in terms of on people who have like an associate's degree but have higher incomes, there there's a tendency to be the way they narrate their own life story, the arc of how they achieve sex, economic success. They kind of, I would say, like I have a theory that they kind of project that onto the rest of the world and say, you know, we didn't you need government or any special services, so why should anyone else? Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondering if there's, if you ever looked at the correlation between education and income, like people who are high income earners, obviously education be correlated with high income, sure, and therefore they might have a more like. Uh, more, more likely to be more socially trouble, but more be like to understand other different fields, other circumstances and, and pathways to economic achievement than say people who earn lots of income but then achieve it through um, perhaps not necessarily through a, a, an education or a standard uh, path. Right, so controlling for, in, controlling for education, um, income will predict conservatism, and that's absolutely true. Um, in a, income and education are in all of these models, but we, uh, we only put the sort of explanation variables out here in the interest of space. I can actually speak a little bit to your Tea Party questions. Who are the Tea Party supporters? I just happen to be ready with a slide on that. Don't ask me how or why. Um, so the red numbers represent across both groups. So that's, that's sort of universal uh, total, the total of 100. Uh, over 40% of Tea Partiers are just conservatives, upper income conservatives. That's not surprising. The next largest number are low income liberals. Now that makes no sense at all. Except that my guess is if I put racial resentment in here, I would wipe this out. So you get this very interesting distribution. So 20% of whites and 13% of non-whites reported some level of sympathy to the Tea Party movement. Um, over 40% of the identifiers are upper income economic conservatives. Between a quarter and a third are low income people expressing consistently liberal policy preferences. And I think that that's entire, almost entirely explained by race. But we haven't gotten to the modeling stage on that. I also have patterns uh, by income quartile, which gets exactly to what you were asking about. So, the share of a, of a group's Tea Party sympathizers by income quartile. So whites are the lighter bars, and most, and, and about an equal share of the first, second, and third income quartile claim to be supportive of the Tea Party and only a tiny bit of the wealthy. Among minorities, where support for the Tea Party is much, much lower, Tea Party supporters are overwhelmingly wealthy, wealthy, wealthy minorities. Um, there you go. The share of sympathizers share by I have another question. Sure. It's a brief one this time. Um, the long one was very helpful. <laughs> what, to what, I mean, when you ask, do these surveys, do people indicate whether they actually vote or not? I mean, are, are, what is the, the sort of universe of people, of voters and non-voters? And the, again, the reason behind that is, what I said earlier, namely that Americans vote at such low levels and the people who don't vote are so disproportionately poor and people of color 
That's right. Um, so the universe of this are citizen eligible adults. So it includes people who are not registered and registered people who do not vote. But everyone in the sample frame is a citizen of the United States over the age of 18, um, which is the sample frame for the National Election Study. The non-institutionalized 18 and over citizen eligible population of the United States. And so that's a good thing. Um, we have measures of the, their political participation, and we could actually validate measures, and we may in fact do that, validate whether or not they have any vote history. That would provide a really interesting insight into what's happening. Anybody else? Yeah? Um, this is kind of a little bit off topic, but it's kind of related in an indirect way. You talked about the NES being in trouble, or Ben mentioned it, do you say more about that? I mean, yeah. In the continuing resolution that was adopted to fund the remainder of the, this current fiscal year, the National Science Foundation was prohibited from funding any political science grant that was not deemed by the National Science Director as in the economic interest of the United States or a matter of national security. This amendment was authored by Senator Coburn of Oklahoma and was adopted by voice vote in the Senate and then adopted through the House after the reconciliation conference committee process. 